Welcome to the SAG After Foundations, the business program. I'm Lori Hamill. Before we're joined by our guest today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After members. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the SAG After Foundation has given over $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you are a SAG After member and you need help, please ask. And if you can give, please do. You can find more information about this in the description of this video. Thank you so much for your generous support. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our guests for today, Miota Edoga, Paul Butler, and Jed Cohen. Welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Hello. Hello. <laughs> all right. So here we all are. What I'd love to have happen is in the chat, for all of those who are viewing today, if you could please let us know, what are you most interested in walking away with today? as far as information that you'd like to get. Let's take a look. All right, well, one thing just to let you know off the top is that we are going to be recording this today and you'll be able to find this on the SAG After Foundation uh, channel on YouTube. So that's really great. So we've got taxes, investing, investing, financial stability, IRAs, investing on a low budget. Okay, great. Wonderful. Okay, I'm seeing investing in real estate, debt reduction. That's a good one. Oh, about an S Corp. That's great. LLC, a little bit about retirement planning, financial stability and wealth building. Love all this. Okay. Staying focused on my finances, not getting depressed and unfocused about it. Amen. Okay. So thank you so much um, for letting us know what you're interested in, in uh, learning today. Roth IRA, I'm seeing that retirement planning. Okay. So panelists, we see what, uh, what members are interested in today. And that's great. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering um, the topics of financial wellness, banking basics, and investment specifics. So Thank you for letting us know what you're interested in, and we're going to try to cover that as we go today in this program. Um, first of all, what I love about our panelists today is that everybody has a background in performing. And just to kick us off, what I'd love to hear is, what do you wish that you knew when you were a performer about money? Miata, do you want to start with that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I am still very much a performer. and. What I wish, honestly, I wish I'd been taught anything about money. Like the reality is that we have an education system that focuses on all kinds of things, but tends to leave out any basic financial education. And then for me, entering a career where the income is really up and down, it's not, we call people like us, non-traditional earners, um, that made financial understanding even more important. So I wish I'd been given that foundation. Absolutely. Jed? Well, I had a number of jobs before I came to entertainment. I, I had a number of, I, I was actually successful in about two or three careers. So I, I think that what I would attribute that to, you know, when I was about 14, I was kind of a juvenile delinquent and my father made me, every time I would get off of school, I would have to go into his office and work for the rest of the afternoon. And on weekends, he would give me projects to do. And so I got a lot of training in business. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think that's a big part of it. But the other thing is that um, I think the most important thing is nobody ever said to me, you know what, you're 16. If you start a retirement account now, you're going to have millions when you retire, you know, <laughs> which, which I think is, is something that, um, you know, the importance of saving, I think, is something mm. that 
uh, really is important for everybody because without those savings, uh, you never really build up any capital to, to invest with or, or do things. Right. And for you, Paul? Yeah, you know, I kind of echo uh, what Jed had talked about in terms of wealth management. I think, you know, and, and it's probably harder when you're younger, 16, 15, to really connect to that. When somebody is telling you, you should save your money because you can make millions. I mean, it, it seems so far away um, and hard to really grasp. But I think when I think about when I was younger, I wish I would have understood the, the, the strength of money and, and saving it and what that really would mean and have someone that really mentored me in that. So going forward in my adult life, I knew, you know, at least I was ahead of myself and I could really understand budgeting and ensuring that I was on the right path on terms of spending money and saving money. So, and understanding the, 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 the wants and the needs, I think that's so important. Um, so I kind of wish I would have uh, really understood that when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Well, and our program today is about financial literacy. And I think that we can all jump in at any time um, you know, to be on our own learning path. But uh, what I'm so excited about today is that I think everyone's going to be able to walk away with something that, that we've learned from this. Um, so one of the things that everyone has in common, it seems to me as performers, is that we all deal with a freelancer schedule as far as money. Because even if you're in a long running hit show, it eventually will end. And um, I mean, we all know that it's, but it's the reality is we're, we're oftentimes looking for the next thing and we don't have that steady build of income that we can rely on for a long period of time. So with that at the heart of all of this, because we are dealing with this kind of, you know, sporadic income, um, I think it would be great if we started out with Paul talking about the basics of, of banking and keeping in mind what people were talking about, of course, today in the chat with what um, people want to be able to walk away with today. Um, so, Paul, do you want to start with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So when I think about banking, you know, uh, there's a lot of misconception in, in terms of, you know, checking and savings accounts and money markets and all these things. Um, you know, if you really do the research, you can find um, banks that do a, uh, to offer accounts that there's no fees, no matter what your minimum uh, requirement is. I don't always, you know, in terms of just saving money on that side of it, I would always seek that out um, and take advantage of that. You know, and you think about budgeting, um, you always want to, you know, and I don't want to, you know, maybe some of you already know this, but when you think about an irregular uh, paycheck, uh, really thinking about determining your lowest monthly income when, you know, and really creating a budget from there. Um, you know, and, you know, you obviously want to look at your, your housing, what your rent and mortgage looks like, you budget in your food. And when I mean food, not takeout or not restaurants, that could be part of your restaurant, uh, part more of your entertainment piece of it, savings. And of course, your ut utilities, your insurance. And obviously, you want to really think about how do you keep track of that, you know, there's all types of ways of uh, really trying to keep track of your money, whether it's just a simple spreadsheet. Some people use the old school envelope, this envelope for utilities, and this envelope's for this, and this envelope's for that. I mean, those things work. Um, um, and then there's um, <clears throat> there's actually apps out there. You know, I don't know um, how many people like to use different types of apps. Some are cost money, some don't. I know there's one that I heard about called Mint. It's a free app, and it helps you with your budgeting, and it really you can really categorize your budgeting in, in terms of uh, uh, naming it, like this could be your food app, this could be your uh, uh, category or uh, your entertainment category. So your money can be spread in different places. Oh, Mint is a great and very user-friendly. Awesome. Love it. Good plug. And then there's some other ones. Um, there is like kind of an online, uh, I think it's called Good Budget. It's kind of like the concept of having the envelopes, um, but I believe that's a, a monthly service fee for that one. And again, it's good old fashioned, uh, just using paper. You know, when I, when I grew up, that's what I used. I used what was, gum, what was coming in and what was going out and checked it out every time what was going out. It worked for me. It's really finding what works for you. You know, in terms of bulk purchasing, I think that's a good way of doing things, especially when it comes to uh, your basics, essentials like paper products, um, um, toothpaste, laundry soap. I, I, my wife thinks I'm crazy because I'll buy um, like five packs of toothpaste um, things of uh, big bulk of uh, uh, napkins, and I put dates on it, 
that's tell me how long it actually took me to go through that. And I, I mean, it takes me like months to go through a whole lot of, of like uh, napkins. So that's money I'm saving there too. Unfortunately, it is a little bit of upfront cost, but however, in the long run, it saves you money in terms of buying those, you know, going back and getting toilet paper again over and over and over and over and where you can just buy it in bulk and save money. And of course, roommates, you know, um, it's always good to have those and you can split the cost. And, you know, and I don't know much about SAG in terms of, you know, what advantages, the things that you can uh, take advantage of that they, they may offer. I would, you know, I would think about, you know, if there's offers or things that they, you get discounts of buying things, stuff like that. I definitely would uh, uh, encourage that. Um, you know, and, and it, when you guys go out and do like commercials or shows or whatever, could you actually ask for the clothing that you're utilizing? And, and you know, <laughs> I, I don't have know. To say, you can ask, but very seldom <laughs> have I ever gotten anything. Okay. Yeah. I, don't know. I, I mean, they, they usually don't. The dark. It would be nice if they did, but yeah. in my experience, they haven't. Um, I mean, there's a moral great idea, to- Paul. <laughs> you know, and shop at discount stores, you know, the rack, Nordstrom rack, they always have those big sales. I mean, everything I wear, I don't pay a full price. I go to the rack, I go to Ross, I go to TJ Maxx. Go to the and then just look at all the sales. I mean, my my tie, my shirts, all from Rack, TJ Maxx, and Ross. You know, and I always get compliments. Oh, where'd you get that? I got at the Ross. Ross, really? Yeah, saving money. I you know, you can save a lot of money if you if you're not doing that already. You know, and then you know, I always also would suggest just having more than one savings account. Again, one for maybe for emergencies, um, backup, and what or whatever you may be saving for, and then. Um, I know sometimes people are kind of concerned about their credit. Um, annualcreditreport.com is a good thing to look at, um, just to ensure that you know things are in line. Um, however, annual credit re- report you only can do it once a year, one calendar year, to um, to see what your credit looks like. However, it does not allow you to see your credit score. For additional costs, it can. However, there are two other apps that you could utilize to where you can see your credit score and your um, uh, credit report. And there's no fee for it. And that's Credit Karma, which TransUnion and Equifax, uh, which it's a, an app that will show you trans, your TransUnion um, credit report and your Equifax credit report. And then there's Experian app that will show you your, your uh, Experian credit report and um, your score. And what's great about these, those two apps, Credit Karma, Karma and uh, Experian, it's free. You can look at it anytime of the day, any day without no fee. And, and it really helps you keep control of what your credit score looks like in terms of, you know, how to to um, to build your credit. Um, and the thing about Experian, Experian is probably used 90, about 80, 90% of the time, anytime they do, anyone does a credit uh, check. So Experian app is really a good one. Um, so really, you know, when I think about um, the moral of this story is just really understanding budgeting and what your what you're paying out and being disciplined, being intentional, you know, really having goals. And I think really being disciplined is, is probably the hardest, but that's what you got to do. You got to be disciplined. You got to know what you're coming in and not, you know, de- deviate from that. Um, I always say, if you, if you want to win, you need to know the score. So um, I think if you just being intentional about, every, intentional about everything and being disciplined, on your goals, there's no, you know, you'll be successful in terms of just, you know, making sure that you're not going beyond your means, understanding your needs and wants. Um, so yeah, that's Wonderful. what I got. Paul, that is so great. And I love all your um, thrift reminders too. That is fabulous. Um, lots to think about. Um, I also just want to remind everyone who's watching right now is that this is recorded. So you'll be able to see it at a later date. If you want to go back through like what Paul was talking about in at a slower pace to be able to really take everything in and write it down as you will probably hear a lot of great tips tonight from everybody um, that you can just take, you know, go back to the video and watch. Uh, but Paul really appreciate that. And also your enthusiasm around all of it. And of course, um, If you look in the chat right now uh, for some of the performers, you may see that people have given suggestions of their own uh, maybe credit cards that they have used um, and also discounts that people have found with their SAG after membership. So I think that's a great, great, great tip for all of us. Thank you so much. Mm 
Uh, Jed, would you like to talk to us about some of your tips for investments and things that you think would be helpful to the performers here tonight? Um, well, I actually have a slide show if you'd like me to start that. Yes, we'd love the slideshow. All right. Who doesn't love a good slideshow? All right. So this is uh, Investing 101. I call it Investing Hell. And um, uh, But I, I think based on what we were just talking about, I'm probably going to just kind of drop the script and simplify, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so... Basically, you know, before you begin investing, you have to you have certain goals that you have to meet before you can even decide I want to invest. So you have to have about three years, of, I mean, sorry, three months of cash minimum for your emergency fund. You know, enough money that you can live for three months uh, in case you're out of work or you get sick or whatever, and then. Uh, and then you can start saving money for other goals. And as you build up that money for those other goals, you can then invest that money. You need a certain amount of money to actually get started. So the, 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 most, imp I, you know, the most important concepts, I, there's three basic concepts in investing. One is time, your investment horizon, how long you have, because the more money you have, I'm sorry, the more time you have, the more money you can make. Um, the second is level of risk, which I'll explain later. But basically, in markets, fortune favors the bold. So the highest risk strategies uh, earn the most money, but have the highest risk of failure. And we use diversification to control that risk. And finally, risk tolerance, which is you, how much risk can you stand? <laughs> because risk is the reward, so, but you don't want to have more risk than you can. If you're losing sleep, uh, then you're probably going to jump out of the market, so you won't be able to accomplish anything anyway. So those are the three important concepts that you have to ask yourself when you're, when you're starting to invest. So... The first thing is goal setting and, and, and the purpose of goal setting really, the real question is, what do you need from your money? What do you need your money to do? And when will you need it? So if you're planning for retirement and you have 40 years, you have a long time for that money to work for you. And at the end of re that retirement period, you need to know, okay, I need this much in order to live. Now, we're not really talking about retirement here, I think. I think it's more about um, you know, shorter term. So let's say you have a child who's three years old and you know that uh, when they're 18, they wanna to go to college. You want them to go to college. And so you, um, you know that in 15 years, uh, you need to have X amount of money for tuition. So it's the same with anything. If you're saving to buy a house, if you just need a car, whatever it is that your goal is, you, you know, you need to know how much time you have because you need time in order for the investing to work. This is an example of why that's important, which is that uh, growth compounds over time. So these three people all invest the same money, about $125,000 but they invested in smaller increments over longer times or shorter increments over uh, higher increments over shorter times. And the, the difference in their earnings is huge. Morgan, who's in it for 40 years, makes 842,000. And Jordan, who's in it for 20 years, makes 302. The reason is because, as you can see, in the beginning, things build up slowly, but as each compound earning accrues, it earns more money. So it's that passive income that really, um, and that's at an 8% return. The S&P 500 averages about 10% over time. And that means every seven years, your money can double. So then once you decide, okay, uh, this is my goal, um, then 
you have to decide how to reach that goal, right? So you have to decide what you're going to buy. And there's four basic types of securities, four asset classes. One is cash and cash alternatives. One is fixed income alternatives and equities. Cash and cash alternatives are cash in your savings account, in your checking account, under your mattress, or if you have a, a CD that would, you know, that's under a year, that's considered a cash alternative because they're very low risk, and, but they don't pay very much, but they're highly liquid and they have low risk. Fixed income is, is basic, that's, that's bonds, which is basically debt. You say, if you buy a $25,000 bond, GM bond, um, you're saying to GM, I will loan you $25,000 for five years at 3%, and at the, so I'll make 3% for, for five years, and then you'll pay me the whole 25,000 back. So you have that guaranteed uh, repayment of principal and you get a pretty good income at regular intervals. Alternatives are all the things you've heard of but don't understand like real estate, private equity, venture capital, hedge funds, things that um, you're never going to buy by yourself, but you can get them in the form of funds. And the difference they, between them and bonds and stocks is that when bonds go one way and stocks go another way, uh, alternatives do something different usually. So they're not correlated in their behavior. So if equities are going up, alternatives uh, might be going down or might be going sideways. And so it's just another way to diversify. And then finally, there's equities, which is stock. And that stock is actually ownership in the company. So if I buy $25,000 worth of GM stock, I'm saying, hey, GM, I'll pay you 25 grand. Now I'm a partner. I, I got all the benefits of ownership, like dividends and so forth. And I also get uh, greater growth because with, when the, as, as the company becomes more valuable, the value of the stocks rises. So uh, that's, that's the basic assortment of um, those are the things that you can choose from. Uh, and, and the difference between them is risk too. Uh, cash is very low risk, fixed income is a little higher risk. But you can see risk goes this way from low to high, potential return goes higher. So with more risk comes more return. And equities have the highest risk and the highest return. Um, the thing about buying meat from these different asset classes is uh, you can do it by yourself. Uh, but if you do, then you have to figure out how much do I need from as each asset class and and how do I build a portfolio of all different things within each asset class? For example, if you're going to buy stocks, yeah, to have a balanced portfolio, you need about 25 stocks. So nobody uh, on this call probably has the time, the energy, or the inclination to spend all of their time monitoring 25 stocks. So for, for most people, uh, funds are a good solution. And funds come in two varieties, mutual funds and ETFs. And the funds buy a, a diversified portfolio of stocks or of bonds or both, and you're buying a share of that fund. They have managers who decide when and what to buy or sell. You just set it and forget it, and you don't have to worry about it. You just monitor their progress. Um, the one downside of a fund, mutual funds tend to be a little bit more expensive, but you, you, know, you have to pay a manager. So they have internal fees. Um, but, uh, and the other thing is that uh, there are tax cons different tax consequences. So there's mutual funds um, where they, they have a, you know, a professional manager doing the management, they charge you for that. And then also, they distribute capital gains. 
Uh, so you have to pay taxes at the end of the year, whether you sold it or not, um, on any of the gains in the fund. So ETFs or exchange traded funds were an alternative to mutual funds that sprang up because people were tired of paying high management fees and tired of paying uh, for uh, taxes. So, you know, tax other people's taxes. So um, what exchange traded funds do is they trade like stocks. Um, so they're very liquid, same as mutual funds. They're diversified, but generally they don't have a big management structure. They tend to be less expensive and you don't pay any capital gains until you sell them. Capital gains are important because um, you, you know, that decreases the amount of your, your uh, investment capital if you have to pay, gains, uh, pay tax, taxes on the gains. So uh, this just basically makes the point that it's not about timing the market because a lot of people want to jump in when they think, you know, stock prices are low and then jump out when they're high, which never works. 91% of your uh, success in, in uh, or your outcome rather, is, is due to allocation that you choose for those assets. So it's, it's super important. And so basically you decide, I have this goal, I, I, need, I need to get to that goal in, in 10 years, so I'm gonna go a little bit more aggressive here. If you're looking to save for retirement, you have a very long investment horizon, so you can afford to be more aggressive. And also if you can tolerate that risk, then you can afford to be more aggressive. If you have a shorter term, then you're probably gonna go more toward balanced growth uh, where uh, there's a little bit less risk. And as you get closer and closer to your goal, you think more about capital preservation. And all that means is in the more conservative ones, you have more bonds. And in the more aggressive ones, you have less bonds and more equity and alternatives. So this, says, this is what I was saying about market timing. Uh, it really doesn't work. It's really a flawed strategy. If you're in the S&P 500, if you were in the S&P 500 between 1990 and 2020, let's say you have $100,000 in the market, you, you would have earned 10.1% per year on average. If you tried to jump out and jump back in again and you missed 15 of the best days in the market, your, your return would jump, jump to six, sorry, drop to 6.6% and so on, it goes on and on. So if you're out 90 days of the best days, you're gonna lose money. You would have lost money in that, in that period. So it's very important not to let your fears uh, and your emotional concerns uh, determine when you get in and out of the market. The best thing to do is to invest and to stay in it. If you have a diversified portfolio and you're invested in quality funds, you, you really don't need to worry that much. So that's a really basic approach. Very quick, I know, because I have a limited amount of time. But uh, uh, that's, that's a very basic approach. Um, and, and to sum it up, time is money. Different asset classes serve different purposes in your portfolio. Diversification provides better risk and return opportunities. Skip that. Patience. Successful investing it requires patience and fortitude. Okay? Um, so that's it for me. Uh, Thank you so much, Jed. That was a lot of great information, and we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on. Okay. Abs absolutely. Miata, would you like to talk about financial wellness? I would love to. Thank you, Lori. And yes, Paul and Jed, thank you for all of this information. I, I approach financial wellness from a very specific place. I, for those of you, and I see some familiar names, 
that are familiar with our work at Abundance Bound, the biggest thing that I believe is that we have to recognize we all have a relationship with money. It is not a relationship that I get to choose whether or not I'm going to have it. And I think that is so critical because if you agree that this is a relationship that you absolutely must have and that you will have for your entire life, then what logically follows is that you want and need that relationship to be as strong as possible. Lori, we can all think of a time when we've had a relationship in our lives with a person and that relationship has not been good, right? Maybe it's been, there's not trust in the relationship, there isn't honesty, there's inconsistency, there's fear, all of these kinds of things. And wouldn't you agree that that has a significant impact on how you're showing up in the world, right? But with our relationships with other human beings, often we have a choice as to whether we can create a boundary between us and that relationship. With money, we don't have that choice. And so the reason that I stress this is because I think once we accept that, we start to recognize what we have to bring in order for any relationship in our lives to be a healthy one. If I ask you your relationship with your partner or your best friend, what does that relationship require in order to be healthy? You would rattle off a list. You would say it requires attention. It requires time. It requires honesty. It requires love. It requires balance. So what I want to ask everyone who's here is how are you bringing love and honesty and consistency and understanding and balance? How are you bringing those things to your relationship with money? I took a look at the chat and the list of things that everyone shared that they were hoping to get from this workshop. Information about debt and student loans, credit scores, taxes, bookkeeping, retirement, IRAs, investing, real estate, S cores, LLCs, trusts. How do I budget on an inconsistent income? How do I allocate my income for all of the expenses we have as actors, as well as those everyday costs that regular people have to be responsible for. John put in the chat, what do I do with that first big paycheck from an acting job? And everyone, what I wanna say that I feel like these questions really should illuminate for all of us is the way that we are approaching our relationship with money. And I say this with an enormous amount of love and understanding, because as I said at the beginning, I, I made a mess of my finances in my early years as an actor. I was at one point over $80,000 in credit card debt. So I understand, but I think, and this really, when I look back at how I was approaching my financial relationship, I was coming to workshops like these, trying to answer so many questions about a key relationship in my life. It is not possible, the information that Paul has shared, that Jed has shared, this is great information. And information 
and knowledge is very, very different from implementation. And in order to implement, we are all going to have to really decide how are we going to show up for this relationship in order to create the foundation that allows us to truly soar, not just in our careers as actors, but in our lives, in our time, in whatever it is that you are here on this planet to do. So the questions are great ones. They're important ones. But what you first have to really make sure you know is what is your starting point right now? Paul talked about some great budgeting strategies, some great ways to try to cut costs. I believe that one of the mistakes we make as actors, as non-traditional earners, is that we believe I cannot budget because I do not know how much money is coming in. And so what we do is we tie those things. And there's a reason we do that. We do that because the traditional financial world says to us, take your paycheck and break it up and allocate your paycheck into exactly how you are going to spend it. The problem with that is that I may have a paycheck of $8,000 this month, and then I might not have a paycheck for another month or two months, right? And so what I suggest is I'm going to ask everyone to separate those things. I want you to separate how you're spending from how you're earning. And the only question I want you to answer is how are you spending? And I want you to figure out how you're spending completely without, I know it's hard, but trying to put aside what am I earning? Let's figure out what you're spending first. Then once you have a, a, a clear picture of where your money is currently going, we have the opportunity to, from a place of clarity, from a place of consciousness, to look at where our money is currently going and to make some decisions about what we are willing and able to change. And once I determine what I am willing or able to change, that is when I can look at what on average is coming in and figure out if there is a discrepancy, if there is a gap between those numbers. The strategies like credit card points, the strategies that Jed has shared with regards to investing, these are all really powerful things that we want to implement in our lives. But what I want to share, the biggest thing that I want to share today is that you have to approach those strategies from a clear foundation. And once you, once you identify where you are, then we can start to chart the course between where you are right now and where it is that you want to go. And all of these things, taxes and bookkeeping and escorts and trusts, all of these are questions that you can then get answered with specifics with regards to your particular situation. But you have to know that first. And I think that the sag After Foundation, it is such an incredible resource for us as performers. But in order to take advantage of these resources, we have to be willing to get real about what this relationship is, to make a commitment 
to how you're going to show up to that relationship and then to seek the specific resources that you need to move you forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Miata. Really appreciate that perspective. Um, you know, what was so beautiful about the way this panel was put together is that having you three here today from different perspectives to really open up these questions. And um, obviously, we can see from the chat, there are so many questions that have come up. In order to be able to work with our time that we actually have today. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I really, we could just stay here for a very long time to get all these questions answered. And um, so what I'd like to do is pick out a few uh, questions that are from the chat, and then anyone can jump in to um, go ahead and answer those uh, if you, if you want to take it. Um, either we could have one person answer or if everybody has an idea around it. Um, but we'll probably be going another um, 20 minutes or so. So let's see how many questions we can get answered in this time. Okay, well, there was a question that came up. What to do with the first big acting paycheck? How to invest the paycheck? Is there someone who'd like to answer that? I'm happy to give a quick perspective on sure. that. Um, and, and then I'm sure Jed has some great information. What you do with that first big paycheck absolutely depends on where you are right now. But what I would want to see is I would want to see you allocate it into four different categories. So the first thing that you would do is that you would take that paycheck and you would make sure that you covered your regular expenses. So all of the regular expenses for the upcoming month. One of the things that we teach is that you would also be tracking any of the places in previous months where you have come up short, because that's something that happens a lot for us as actors. You know how if I don't pay my cell phone bill, Verizon definitely lets me know that. Well, what we want to do is we want to be clear on what our buckets are that we've had to cheat. I put cheat in quotes in previous months so that the next thing that you would do with that big check that comes in is you would catch yourself up, right? You would actually go back and pay back all of those areas that you've been tracking where based on your goals, you've been short in previous months. So then Lori, let's say that I have, I'm, I'm, after I do all of those things, let's say that I have $2,000 left. I'm just making that up. I would want to see you divide that $2,000 into four quadrants. The first quadrant would be to make an extra payment to what we call your planned savings. It's commonly called an emergency fund. I prefer to use the word planned savings because I don't want us always reacting like everything is an emergency. I want us to have a fund for the money we actually expect to have to spend because things happen. I would want you to put an extra payment towards your debt plan if you have debt. And a huge thing is that we have to have you set up a debt plan to get you off the roller coaster of a lot of money comes in and I throw a lot of money at the credit card and then I don't have any money. So I use the credit card again. We have to actually set up a plan. So I would want you to make an extra payment to your debt plan. I would want you to make an extra allotment towards your wealth. And so that would be the investing strategies that you have in place for the future. And then I would want you to give yourself something that you have wanted, something that you've been working towards, whether that's an investment in your career or an investment in something fun. And I'm not saying that those four quadrants would have to be equally divided but I would want to see you acknowledge all four quadrants because what some of us do is we get a big check and we go out and spend it. 
Others of us, we get a big check and we're terrified. And what we want to do is to start to feel that we have a clear plan that includes treating ourselves in those periods where there is more money. Great. Thank you. That is so easy to remember in terms of thinking of breaking things up into four. And um, I know that you have other programs too, where people could check it out if they wanted to, to find out more about what you're talking about. Is that right? Absolutely. Abundancebound.com. Great. Um, So uh, I was wondering, Jed, um, someone had asked, is micro-investing a good way to start or do you need to save up enough to buy into mutual funds? Someone had asked that. Um, I would say... I mean, for mutual funds, there's a very low buy-in. I mean, that's the great advantage of mutual funds is that you don't need a lot of money to buy some shares of a mutual fund. And Mm -hmm. by buying those shares, you get instant diversification. So I would say um, if you can meet the minimum of of that fund, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what that most, you know, if you, if you invest at Vanguard, it's probably, $1,000. $1,000. So, um, you know, if you can meet that requirement, then um, you can start investing. So, um, and I think that, you know, any money that you put in, especially if, you know, if you're young and just starting out, it, you know, that's, that's going to be really important when you get old. So, you know, I, I would just encourage you to start as quickly as you can. And, and, um, you know, pick an assortment of funds, you know, maybe start with some stocks because if you're young, you have a long investment horizon and then, you know, build that up a little and then add some bond funds and, you know, add assets as you get enough money to, to build a portfolio. And just another question I want to ask you about is, do you think we need, uh, this is the question that came in, do you think we need to hold off investing for now as market is high and wait for the next recession? No, that's what we call market timing. That was okay. one of my slides. Yeah. Okay. Is, yeah. Never do that. You know, it's, I have a brother who's a wise guy and he always thinks he's going to buy low mm-hmm. and sell high, but individual investors who try to time the market almost invariably do the wrong thing. I, you know, in fact, professional investors use um, gauges of, cons- of individual investor sentiment in order to decide what not to do. <laughs> so, uh, so no, I would not wait for a recession because you don't know when the recession is coming and you'll miss all of that time in the market when you could be earning dividends and interest and accruing some value. Right. Thank you. Um, Paul, could you answer this question for a member that asked? Um, We'd love to hear about the pros and cons of credit unions versus banks. Yeah, sure. That's a good question. You know, really, there really is no bad thing about a credit or a, a, a credit union and a bank. A bank is obviously mandated by the federal government. We have certain regulations and uh, credit unions is member owned. So for example, Boeing, Boeing employee credit union. So it's basically all the members own that. Um, they are insured by the, um, you, I can't think of, or FDIC insured is, is, is banks. And then the credit unions are insured by, uh, I can't remember I want to say SPIC, but that's that's Jed stuff. So I don't want to get too deep into it, uh, his uh, stuff. Right. But I, I can't remember how what. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember what they're insured by. But it's there's really no big difference in the to, to be, between the two. It's just what your comfort level is. Uh, they all offer the same thing. Um, even though credit unions do say they're nonprofit, they are, but they are still a profitable company. They still got to, you know, they still are profitable, um, but they do exactly the same thing that uh, a bank does. So there's really no, I really say there's no, it's just a preference thing. There's really no pros or cons between the two. Um, some people just like credit unions because they're smaller, they're more community based, um, where, you know, you got banks where they're national banks, you know, Union Bank, US Bank. Um, some people don't like to go to those banks. Um, so p- some people prefer the smaller banks, which are the community ones, which typically are the credit union ones. So it's just a re- really a preference thing um, uh, when you decide what, uh, what institution you want to go to. 
Also for you, Paul, um, someone wrote, I was told if you can't pay full amount of credit card bill, that paying plus 15% more than your due amount moves you into a different risk credit category, true or false? What was that question? Your... Uh, oh, is that, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I wasn't okay. sure. Someone said, I was told <coughs> you can't pay full amount of credit card bill, that paying plus 15% more than your due amount moves you into a different risk credit category, true or false? That's what I had from a member. Um, so you're paying more. It sounds like you're paying more than your normal balance that you're normally yeah, paying over your balance. So. Mm -hmm. um, no, because they can't it doesn't pay the put full you amount. any kind Oh, they can't pay the full amount. Right. Yes, that can put you in a risk uh, category. Yes, it okay. can. Yeah. I I think, okay. sorry, right. Lori, I, the way that I yeah, understood I that question, um, there are a lot of myths out there about what will improve our credit score and what will put us in a different um, in a different risk category, which is basically as your score increases, your your the risk that lenders are taking on you reduces. And that is not true. That that is a myth that if I pay 15% more than my minimum owed, um, I will, it will move me into a different risk uh, category. The largest way to um, move yourself, to raise your credit score, thereby moving yourself into a different risk category is to reduce your debt to credit ratio. So what that basically means is that if I have $10,000 of available credit, my score will go up the, lo the lower amount that I owe in relation to that $10,000 of available credit. Where most people will see the largest jump in their score is when your debt drops below 30% of your available credit. So if I have $10,000 of available credit, I will see the highest jump in my score when I have lowered my debt below $3,000. Thank you. And you're correct, yep. Uh, and then- Thank you. Wanted to just, someone had written about, um, talking about SEPs, uh, SEP, and if that was um, something that they should look into. Does someone wanna handle that? Sure. I'll do that. Thanks, Tom. Um, a SEP IRA is uh, a, a retirement account for people who are self-employed, and it's a, it's a self-employed pension fund, but it also has the IRA characteristic as well. So in, in years when you are making money, you can put more money into a SEP than you can into an IRA. Uh, into a normal IRA. If you just have an IRA, you're limited to, uh, depending on your age, it could be $6,000 or $7,000 a year. A SEP IRA, you can pay in 22.5% of what you earn up to a maximum of, I think it's $54,500 this year. Uh, it changes now every couple of years. Um, and so obviously if you're making money and you wanna put money toward retirement, uh, that's a good way to do it because you can't put as much into an IRA. The advantage of the SEP IRA too is that uh, you are allowed to make an IRA contribution and a SEP contribution in the same year and you can make them into the same account. So uh, if you're, you know, if, if you, put in the 54,000 and, and you have another 6,000 that you want to put in uh, for your IRA contribution, you can do that as well. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do right now, because we are getting ready to um, end the program, is that um, I would like to hear if you have any tips, um, our panelists, uh, for people where they could look to get more information um, or helpful things, uh, resources that they might look into. Um, Paul, do you have anything that you, would you like to share uh, with everyone? I know you've given us a lot of tips already. 
Yeah, I would just again just look at budgeting apps um, and Google ways of, of you know how to budget. I mean, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. It's it, there's no one particular way. It, there's all different ways of doing it. And there's no one size fit all. So I would really encourage anyone to really Google that. I mean, there's a lot of great information out there um, in terms of just using different apps and how to budget. Um, and then um, as far as uh, uh, keeping track of your credit, I would encourage Credit Karma uh, or the Experian app that really help you guide you and how to, you know how what your credit will look like and how you can maintain that. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Wonderful. And Jed? Um, I think, you know, uh, I remember in the 90s, the Motley Fool had a, an investment primer that they put out and you could, you could read that and it would tell you everything you needed to know about what these different elements are and so forth. So uh, I don't know if they still publish that or not, but um, there are, I mean, you can get investment for dummies or things like that that will explain, explain the breadth of the market. and. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's some online courses, uh, you know, things like that, that you can take for free. Uh, the other thing is you can contact an investment company and see what kind of brochures they have and so forth that they can give you. And, and reading, I mean, I, I read investment columns and uh, that is, you know, handy for just getting the jargon down. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Miata? I have so many resources that I love, but uh, some of the key ones um, for, for people who are really trying to figure out how to get started in investing, I absolutely agree with Jed that there are some wonderful books. I'm a huge fan of The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins. I think that it's a great, um, he wrote it for his 18 year old daughter who said, dad, I don't wanna deal with this. Um, and to help her understand a simple path to wealth. So I'm a big fan of that. I also really love Jean Chatsky's podcast, Her Money. Every week there is an episode dealing with topics that would address so many. So you can scan so many of the questions asked here today. She just did recently an amazing one on buying a new car. And it was really timely um, and, and very practical information. And then, of course, I would plug our podcast, the Abundance Bound podcast, and all the free resources that are available at AbundanceBound.com, because there are a lot of tools that at no cost can get you started. Great. And would you just repeat that one time? Someone in the chat asked it, if you would repeat the name. Oh, yes. Jean Chatsky's podcast. Oh, I'm sorry. Your podcast. Oh, was... my, our podcast is Abundance. Found. We're okay. very consistent. Wonderful. Thank <laughs> you. So, uh, you know, I thought of one that I really love. Oh, please. And I recommend it to people. It's called The Little Book That Beats, That Still Beats the Market. Wow. And, um, it was published by Joel Greenblatt, and he wrote it for his grandson originally. And um, so um, it's a very good introduction to uh, the the, the basic ideas of investing. Great. Um, I, I want to thank our panelists today. Um, I think you can see in the chat, um, everyone is just saying thank you so much for this information, Miata, Paul, and Jed. I want to thank the SAG Foundation for putting this together, uh, for Janani um, bringing this idea to life. It's so wonderful to have uh, even though it's just scratching the surface and maybe just that we're starting the conversation tonight. Maybe it's that you're starting the conversation with yourself and really asking, what do I need to know? And we've heard some resources here today. Um, what you can do is you can go ahead and listen uh, and watch this uh, video again. This will be listed on the SAG After Foundation's YouTube channel um, whenever they get it all edited and up, all that. Um, so you can listen to it again, again, you know, slowly if you need to, um, just to let these ideas sink in. I really appreciate everyone's questions tonight in the chat and for those um, making clarifications for others that people were asking in the chat questions there. So thank you so much. 
Happy New Year to everyone and um, wishing everyone a safe and healthy 2022. Thank you. Thank you, you, Lori.